As a real estate investor, have you ever ran the numbers on an investment property and you were really excited about it because you were getting it at a low price and you knew about what it was gonna to cost to fix up and you had a really good idea of what it would be worth in the end? But then, after going through the whole process, at the very end, the appraiser comes back and values your property twenty or $30,000 less than what you planned for at the beginning? Well, today we're gonna to talk about four ways of influencing an appraiser. Well, that's not what a friend of mine told me. Maybe you know him. His name is Abraham. No, not like that. We're gonna talk about four legal ways of how to influence an appraiser. Now, you're gonna to wanna to stay until the very, very end of this video because the fourth way of influencing an appraiser has been something that we've done over and over and over again, and it's made us hundreds of thousands of dollars. My name is Shiloh Lundahl, and you're watching the Improved Channel focused on real estate investing. Before we start talking about how to influence an appraiser, we first need to understand what is the appraisal process like and why would we need to influence an appraiser to begin with? Well, first off, it's important to understand that the appraisal process is not an exact science. In fact, there's a lot of subjective opinion that appraisers use in order to come up with a value for a property. And as a real estate investor, you want to make money on properties. So a lot of times what that means is you want to buy a property well under market value that even after you fix the property up, you're still able to sell it for above what you bought it for and fixed it up for so that you can make a profit. But here are some problems with that. Sometimes when you buy properties under market value, it can influence an appraiser to give you a lower value. And also, if you're going to flip the property, if you've increased the value of the property by a certain percentage, sometimes lenders have a problem issuing loans to buyers that want to buy your property if you've been able to increase the value a whole lot within a short period of time. So buying that property well under market value can actually hurt you rather than help you if you're looking to flip the property quickly. Another issue with buying properties under market value is that bankers will sometimes ask you how they're supposed to value a property so high when you bought it for so low. For example, if you buy a property for $300,000 and you only put $50,000 into it, and now the comparables in the area say that the property is worth $500,000, the bank may come to you and say, how am I supposed to value it at 500,000 if you only bought it at 300,000 and put 50,000 into fixing it? I can't really value it at $500,000. That makes me so frustrated sometimes because the value of a property shouldn't be contingent upon what I bought it for because I'm an investor and I'm able to buy properties under market value. So it frustrates me when they think, well, because I just bought it for 300 and I put 50,000 into it, it shouldn't be worth 500, especially when the properties in the area would support a $500,000 valuation. And this has happened over and over and over again. So what do you do as an investor whose strategy is buying properties under market value, fixing them up, and then trying to force equity and push that value higher when you have banks and appraisers that tend to lower the value based on their opinion? Well, here are four ways of combating that. First, provide the appraiser with information. See, the appraiser is going to come in and take a look at the property, and they're going to use the information that they have to come up with a value. But let's say that the plumbing was bad. The appraiser is not going to go in there and know that the plumbing was bad, but you may have had to spend maybe fifteen dollars or $20,000 to redo the plumbing in the entire house. And the appraiser is not going to know that. But that might be one of the reasons that you were able to buy the property under market value, because you need to go in and replace the plumbing. Or let's say you put a brand new roof on the property. You see, when you provide a detailed list of the things that you've done, along with the costs of each item, it can help the appraiser come up with a value that makes more sense. So that is the first way that you can influence an appraiser. Second, what if the appraiser comes back and the value is low? One thing that you can do is you can rebut the appraisal. 
Now, there are ways of doing that that are effective and ways of doing that that are less effective. If you come back to the appraiser and say, you know what, this property is valued higher, here's some comps, you're stupid, I hate you, you should lose your job. That's not going to help you at all be able to get a better appraisal. That appraiser will probably dig in his heels and not budge at all. But rather than doing that, there are more effective ways on how to rebut an appraisal. My business partner, Jason Moss, has been an appraiser for years, and he knows what words to use with an appraiser in order to help the appraiser take a look at certain things that the appraiser may have missed. And he does it in such a way that it doesn't make the appraiser feel defensive. Here's an example of ways to phrase things in order to make it so that the appraiser doesn't feel so defensive. You can say something like, I took a look at the appraisal and I can understand the value that you came up with using the comps that you did. I wonder if you recognized though that the subject property actually has irrigation to it, which if you take a look at the market, usually increases the value by about $10,000 for properties that are on irrigation versus properties that are not on irrigation. Let's say you would like him to consider other comparables rather than just the ones that he used in the appraisal. You may be able to say something such as, in my research on looking for the value of this property, I noticed that there was this property that looks really similar to the subject property. And this property sold within the last 30 days at this price. And so you can ask them to consider other comparables and things like that. And another way of rebutting the appraisal is by having another appraiser come in and appraise the property, maybe before the bank's appraiser does. That way you can take a good look at the comps and then you can even provide that appraisal to the appraiser if you want to beforehand so they can take a look at it. Or you can have the appraiser go in and you know do the appraisal and then if you need that other appraisal to fight it, you can use that other appraisal to fight the bank's appraiser's opinion. The third way of influencing an appraiser is by buying a property in the same neighborhood that you have other properties in and buying it over value. Wait a second, that sounds like market manipulation. Well, it kind of is. Take a look at this video clip that Pace Morby did on Bigger Pockets a few months back. So much cash in the market right now because the hedge funds are saying, we believe that the market's gonna to continue to soar and soar and soar. And they are partly you know, to blame for the manipulation of the market a little bit, but really they see what we see or rather, I should say, we see what they see because you know they're ahead of the curve on us. They do way more research. They have way more money, way more resources. But they're pouring their money into real estate right now because they know even if they buy over retail. Okay, and I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a really interesting thing that just happened to us. They're paying over retail on houses right now. And they're happy to do so. We just sold a house to Open Door. Okay, we sold a house to Open Door. And the retail value of the property was $350,000. They paid $399,000 sight unseen. They waived uh, appraisal. They waived their inspection, bought it as is, $399,000. They never even saw the house. They're moving the market because here's what happened. We, we researched that neighborhood and found they own 21 homes in that neighborhood. So them paying $49,000 over retail what they did is they amplified the value of all those other homes. So yes, they might've paid $49,000 over retail on that one house, but they probably made a million and a half dollars in appreciation by forcing the appraisals to, you know, for, for history to, to happen in that market. We see the people doing that. We see a lot of that happening and there is manipulation in the market. So some of the hedge funds are willing to overpay for one property, especially if they own several other properties in the neighborhood, because when they overpay for a property, what's happening is they're setting a new bar of what the properties are worth. And if they have several properties in the neighborhood, it brings the value up of all of their properties. So that is another way of influencing an appraiser. But wait a second, Shiloh. I don't have a ton of properties in one neighborhood and I can't go around and just pay $50,000 above asking price for one property to try to bring up the value of all my properties. Well, to be honest, most of us probably wouldn't fit into that category. However, the fourth way of influencing an appraisal, and this is something that I've done over and over and over again, is something that you could probably use and you could probably use it right now.
So do you remember how I said that when you buy a property under market value, a lot of times appraisers and banks have issues with that? Well, what would happen if you just don't buy it under market value? Well, wait a second. If I don't buy it under market value, then how am I supposed to make money with this deal? I will tell you. Instead of buying it under market value, you buy it for market value, but you include what's called a rehab credit. Let me explain how this works. Let's say you go to buy a property, okay? You're going to buy your own primary home. And as you go, you go through the inspection and they wanna sell it for $300,000. Well, in the inspection, you notice that the roof is bad and you notice that the plumbing is gonna to need to be replaced. Those are big ticket items. That may even cost you 25 or 30,000. In fact, if you rip up the plumbing, you need to redo the flooring. That might be an extra 10,000. Man, this is awful. That house that the person was planning on selling for 300,000. Now you have this inspection report that says these things are really bad and I need to take care of these things. It may bring the value down by 30,000 or $40,000. But rather than buying the property for 30 or $40,000 under what the person is trying to sell it for, you can always just buy it what the person is trying to sell it for and then have that person give you a rehab credit. And this is something that we've done over and over and over again is we buy properties at market value and we have the seller give us what's called a rehab credit. And then we can take that money and we can go and we can fix up the property. And then as we fix up that property, we're then able to refinance it with better terms. You see, banks and appraisers oftentimes have issues when you buy the property so far under market value. However, if you buy that property at market value and then the difference between what you actually bought it for and what it shows on paper that you bought it for, you're able to take that money and you're able to go and fix up that property. Then when you go to get a loan with a bank, the bank actually sees that you bought that property at market value. They're able to take a look at that and say, hmm, Okay, well, if you bought it at market value, yeah, it makes sense if you wanna refinance it and that that's the value. And not only that, but when an appraiser takes a look at your property and sees what you bought it for, and then they see all of the fixes and things like that, they take a look at it and say, yeah, I can see that that property should be worth $300,000 rather than $260,000 what you bought that property for. In fact, as investors, we do this all the time, and it works really, really well with the Burr strategy. So we'll get a property, sometimes direct from the seller, or we'll find a property from a wholesaler. They're marketing that property for, let's say, $130,000, and that property should be worth $200,000 when it's finished being rehabbed. And let's say the rehab costs are going to be about twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars. So you're all into this property might be about a hundred and sixty to hundred and sixty five thousand dollars including holding costs and hard money fees and things like that. But if you were to buy the property at a hundred and thirty thousand dollars, what happens is the appraiser sees that property being bought at a hundred and thirty thousand dollars and they may think, well, you know what, if you bought it at a hundred and thirty thousand dollars and you only put you know thirty thousand dollars into fixing it up how am I supposed to value it at $200,000? Even if the property right next door sold at $200,000 and it was the exact model match of your property. You see, appraisals are not an exact science. There's a lot of opinion that goes into them and appraisers have to defend their opinions to a bank. And so if the bank looks at it and says, why did you value this at $200,000 when the person bought it at 130 and only put 25 or $30,000 into fixing it up? Now the appraiser is going to have to say, well, you look at this comp and look at this comp and, and they had good comps, but a lot of times appraisers just may not feel confident to go against the bank that way. So what they usually do is they give a more conservative value of let's say $170,000 to $180,000. And the problem with this is you may have a property worth $200,000 and the appraiser appraises it at $170,000 or $180,000. And then when you go to refinance the property, you have to leave a chunk of your money into that deal because the appraiser came in low. But now when you include a rehab credit in your purchase price, what happens is the appraiser can see that you bought the property at 200,000 and then you were able to use up to $70,000 to fix the property up. Now you may not use all $70,000 or maybe you do use all $70,000. I don't know what you're gonna use on fixing up that property. I try to make it where if I buy that property at market value and I have this large rehab credit, I can use a lot of that rehab credit in order to bring up the value of the property. Now, something important to know is don't just put some arbitrary rehab credit in there trying to increase the value of the property way beyond what the property should be worth. 
because, well, it doesn't help you because an appraiser is going to look at that and say, why in the world did you buy this property for $50,000 above what all of these other comps are doing? Mm, I'm, there's no way that I'm going to give it that big of a value. You just bought the property poorly. So it may not actually influence an appraiser positively at all. So I encourage you to not get greedy with this strategy. I encourage you to work on trying to understand what the value is really well, and then you can buy the property at that value. Again, you can include that rehab credit. Another thing that's important to note with this strategy is this works really well with the Burr strategy, where you buy the property first using either a hard money loan or a private money loan or your own money, and then after you fix it up, you go to refinance the property. Using this strategy in order to purchase the property with a bank loan right up front is not going to work. The bank's probably going to say, I'm not going to lend you more money than what you're actually purchasing the property for. I don't care what you can increase the value to. I'm not going to lend you more money than that. However, when you work with a hard money lender that can help lend the majority of the purchase price and you can close on it quickly, then after rehabbing the property, you can go ahead and refinance the property. So this strategy basically just helps as you refinance the property, or if you're going to flip the property, it helps in that way too. One thing to know about this last technique of including the rehab costs in the settlement statement is it's more of an advanced strategy. And so it may be difficult to do if you're not exactly sure what you're doing because you have to have everybody on board. The title company needs to understand what's going on. The seller needs to understand what's going on and you need to understand what's going on so that the settlement statement and the closing documents are prepared accordingly so that it can record at the higher amount. So keep those things in mind when trying to implement this strategy. Hopefully this video was helpful for you in understanding how to influence an appraiser. If you like this video and if you've liked other videos that I have, please subscribe to the channel. I'd really appreciate it. And I hope that you have a fantastic day investing in real estate.